Thank you, Mrs. Whitback, for your expertise at the piano. You would have been sore pressed again, as we were this morning, rescued at the last moment to have somebody come and share with us at the piano. Please open your Bibles and just read a few, past, a few verses out of the book of Acts, chapter 1, and just follow along, please, as I read the first 11 verses. <clears throat> Acts, chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of, of them forty days, and speaking of the tidings pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had thus spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so in, shall so in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. May God bless to our hearts his word on this Lord's Day evening. I remember as a as a child, having the great privilege of staying up till ooh, 11.30 at night, even a little bit later. My dad at times would be out working, be traveling, and mom said it was okay for me to stay up. And the joy of our evening was watching Johnny Carson. And boy, that's, that was the thrill of, of my heart. One of the most favorite and memorable characters that he portrayed was Karnak the Magnificent. Remember him? The bejeweled turban, the big robe. Ed McMahon would sit next to him and dressed in this a finery. He would take an envelope that was, as he said, hermetically sealed, kept in a mayonnaise jar on Funk and Wagnall's porch. And in this envelope would be a question. And he would divine the answer before opening the question. For example, I have in my hands one of those envelopes, by the way. You know. The answer is the La Brea Tar Pits. And Ed would go, La Brea Tar Pits. Oh, you know. He would go like this. What do you have left after eating La Brea tar peaches? And the people loved it, you know. Supervisor. Supervisor. What does Clark Kent wear to keep the sun out of his eyes? 
supervisor. Did you get that? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. They, 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 they laugh and laugh, laugh. One more I had. What are we confident of better things of? Confident of better things. The missions and the future of the Bible Presbyterian Church. Well, no laughing in that. <clears throat> and yet it is in all aspects and respects our heart's desire. Confident in better things for missions and the future of our Bible Presbyterian Church. It's an optimistic answer. But when it comes to our denomination's history and our mission's history, is it realistic? After all, look at us. Analyzing us from the outside, our numbers are not necessarily overwhelming, are they? Financially, there isn't a church or uh, organization that could not do with a few more dollars. <laughs> They'd all give a hearty amen to that. I'm confident that our missionaries could all use a boost. Uh, we have a number of missionaries on the leeward side of service, and there's not a one that couldn't say, well, we don't need any further help over in our field, and we don't need any further sources of revenue or anything like that. I don't think there's a pastor or assistant pastor or any in a, in a church who couldn't use other Sunday school teachers vacation Bible school helpers, uh, other assistants who would step up and say, boy, I'd surely like to help. Our denominational history seems like we are following Gideon's army out of Judges 7, rightly dividing ourselves down until we get to the point of 300 magical men. Sad to say that's what's happening. And to be honest with you, my own employer has likewise fallen under this same application. At one time, we were up to close to 70 missionaries. Now we are less than half of that. And yet that has never been our intention, has it? Never was, still isn't. Our intention is to be faithful servants and to grow and to look forward optimistically to be used of God in order to bring salvation not only to our regional areas where churches are located, but areas where churches can still be located and the four corners of the world. I wanted to share with you a portion of an article that was written on May 18th, 1936. This is written in the Presbyterian Guardian, and it's entitled, Will Christianity Survive? Think of the time. Think of the period. We're coming up to just before the war. Uh, spiritual struggles of a lot of things that were going on. It was written by a young man called J. Gretchen Machen. He writes, Some weeks ago, I was asked by the editor of the Boston Evening Transcript to contribute to a symposium on the question whether Christianity is facing extinction in the Western world. Can you imagine that? 1936, a valid question being asked, Christianity facing extinction? I said that the question can be answered only if we first answer a more fundamental question, whether the preservation of Christianity depends upon man or upon God. If its preservation depends upon man or upon any natural resources, the chances are overwhelmingly against it being preserved. The whole current of the age is against it. The weapons by which it is being attacked are far more effective than those that were used to be employed. Far more effective ways of stamping out Christianity than the old ways of fire and sword. In our country, religious persecution has not definitely begun. Okay, this is Machen talking about in 36. No persecution that was evident at that time. But every indication is that it is coming very soon. 
this general decay of civil and religious liberty will almost inevitably, in the long run, result in persecution of the Christian religion. Christianity will always stand in conflict with any form of a totalitarian state. Of course, it can escape persecution, meaning the church, if it sits back into a neo-pagan syncretism, that is, if it relinquishes its offensive claim not only to be the one way of salvation, but the only way. But in that case, it will simply cease to be Christianity. If it continues to be Christianity, it is facing a deadly opposition in the modern world. He says all the church has to do is quit with the claim saying we are the only way of salvation. And therefore it disappears. It is facing opposition, not only in the state, but also in the visible church. Both the state then and a denatured church are arrayed against the Christian religion. And what will be the result of this conflict? Will Christianity survive? A little group of people is resisting this tyranny and is resolved to stand true to the Bible even if, in order that to do it, it is obliged to form a separate church organization. How can we who form that group have the timidity to stand against the whole current of the world and against the visible church? How can we stand against so many men who are much abler and much stronger than we? Our answer is plain. It is because of the Bible. Those persons who are against us in this contention are also against the word of God and the word of God stands true. The separate church organization continuing as we believe the true spiritual succession of the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America will no doubt in its beginning be small. We believe that it will grow rapidly by the blessing of God but in the beginning it will only be a very small group. And what's more, it will be a very weak little group and a very sinful little group, utterly without merit or without strength on its own. How then can it survive? For one reason only, because it is in the care and the keeping of God because it is founded upon his unchanging word, and even the smallest and weakest group is strong if it can say, and hear Jesus say, Fear not, little flock. Machen's insight into those things which are to come is simply remarkable. But he stood from the principle of the word of God being the pillar of the, 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 the direction of the church. You know, in those early years of accusations and of charges and of trials and defrockings, the infant Covenant Union Church and then Presbyterian Church of America, as well as its succeeding bodies, undeniably there must have been a feeling that they were indeed the smallest and the weakest. You know, I take comfort in that. They stood against the largest Protestant church in the world at the time. Yet there was an optimism in what these men wrote. There was a hope in their preaching. There was a confidence in how they conducted their church responsibilities. They took to the highways and the byways, and they sowed good seed and good soil from the Dakotas to the Gulf Coast, from India to Indiana, from China to Chinatown. As I said, we had 70 missionaries at one t period of time, and the number of churches that we had formed were just almost unnumerable. These brethren were confident in the fact, as Dr. Machen aptly wrote, that the church was in the care and the keeping of God because it is founded upon his unchanging word, and that its preservation did not depend upon man or any natural resources. All too often today we're in the perception that in order to bring people in there must be a creation of a certain type of building or a facility or offering a, a certain type of carrot in order to attract without the positive preaching 
in the direction of God's word. So the question at hand tonight is, what do missions have to do with the future of the Bible Presbyterian Church? Well, it's not a, it is a spiritual barometer in a certain sense, an indicator of the church's health, an indicator of the congregation's local, local uh, health. Can a congregation who cares nothing for the souls of men and women overseas be expected to care for the condition of the souls of men and women in their own community? I doubt it. After all, who is my neighbor? Does not the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ begin at Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth? But there's no stopping point. Jesus was merely saying that this is where we begin, and then from here it is a natural flow to the uttermost parts of the earth. As the apostles, and for that matter, all of those who were saved in those early chapters of Acts They returned from Pentecost voluntarily, or they were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in Jerusalem at that time. They took back with them to their homes. And to be honest with you, if you sat in Acts, I think it's chapter 4, and you look at where they came from Pentecost to Jerusalem, their home cities, their home towns, their home countries were a thousand mile radius from Jerusalem. Thousand miles from Jerusalem, the gospel went forth, either voluntarily as they returned home or as persecution scattered them back home. As they did return home, did not their hearts burn within them, even as the two who were walking to Emmaus? Think about it. What Christ had done for them at that period of time, the changing of their lives, the bringing of salvation to themselves, and the confidence they had, they said, if it can happen to me, think of who it can happen back home to. Think of the people I know in my community, in my business. They were changed, and they said, this also can take place with the people that I know. The ministry of the fledgling body of Christ grew, irrespective of location. The world was before them. And they thought nothing of being home missions or foreign missions, my church, their church, or whatever. It was growth. Let me read Acts chapter 11, 19 through 26, to point this out. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and great numbers believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which at Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarshish for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They saw what was taking place without the direction of a church or a mission board or anything. This was a movement of the Holy Spirit. Men and women changed and they went forth and they preached Christ. Those who had a, a Jewish background understood some of that. But as we said here, there are those who were Grecians, non Jews. They had no history of Old Testament, but they said, wow, something's happened to me. I've been changed by this resurrected one. The Lord's mandate, the Great Commission, now supported by active and a powerful work of the Holy Spirit, brought about, brought about tremendous results in a very short period of time. The church exploded in size and in impact. 
Obviously, it was not without its trials, not without of its troubles from within and from without. Nevertheless, Christ was preached without a professional clergy. But how? How did they do it? They were so weak and so small. Andrew Murray wrote, The new experience of what Christ has done for oneself leads to a larger trust in what he can do for others. This gives a point and a courage and testifying of him, which brings a new tone into a person's preaching and speaking. Christ becomes more distinctly the center of all thought and all work. At the same time, the source, the subject, the strength of all of our witness. He said when a man comes to Christ, all of a sudden everything comes from Christ and goes out. He comes back to Christ for all of the answers. He directs everything is from Christ. That's how these poor, weak, small believers expanded and grew. There was no slick sales pitch, no fancy offer, no free giveaway. In the early church, the body of Christ, all the church history, men and women have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to live lives of a remarkable testimony. They were convinced that they could do no other, and they went forth to serve their king. Obviously, we're not talking about 100%, but a vast majority of those were empowered, and they did make a change, a did make a difference in history. In Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address, he quoted from the diary of a World War I soldier, Martin Trepto, actually from New Jersey. He was killed in a battlefield, and they found a diary, a book, in his possession. And when they opened up this diary, they found within the pages, written in Trepto's own handwriting, what he referred to as, My Pledge. He says, America shall win the war. Therefore, I will work. I will save. I will sacrifice. I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the whole issue of the struggle depended on me alone. Isn't that neat? His attitude was giving of himself entirely. And I think because... This summarizes the principle of the lives of the believers in those early years, with one exception. Tripto says, the whole issue of the struggle depends upon me alone. Well, it actually depends upon Christ alone. But the volunteerism, the ability to say, I must give my all, was what was found within that early church. The early church lived as believing that they would indeed win the war. And therefore, they would work and save and sacrifice and endure and fight cheerfully and do their utmost as if the whole issue depended upon Christ. You read the stories of the men and women who went to the, uh, the, the burning stakes or thrown to the lions or whatever other tortures that were laid before them. They were doing it cheerfully and joyfully because it was unto their Lord. We read of the demon-possessed man in Mark 5. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how, how much the Lord had done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the, in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all of the people were amazed. You remember the story. You know, the demon-possessed man, uh, the, Jesus cast out the demons into the swine and into the water they went. And they looked upon this man whose body was torn and riddled with, with self-inflicted wounds because of the, the torture that he suffered and the harassment that people had given him all of these years. And once he came to know Christ as his Savior, what he said, I need to do something. Initially, it was, I want to go with you because I want to be with you, Jesus. But when Jesus gave him the command, you have a responsibility to tell others. 
What a marvelous story that must have been. We read in Nehemiah, hearing of the deplorable conditions back in Jerusalem. Nehemiah is crushed when he hears about a people that he had never met. When he hears about the situation of a city that he had probably never seen before. The gates burned and parts of walls torn down and, and people being uh, totally in, in, in persecution and total abuse. He weeps and he mourns and he fasts for certain days. And we know what God did through this one man. He was moved by the Spirit of God because of a condition that was not his own, was not his own responsibility to a people that he never knew, to a place that he had never been to. But God moved him in order that he would make a difference in the lives of people, and it took place. Yet it seems that things have changed over the generations. For a local congregation never to be challenged or equipped or educated to preach Christ at home and abroad results in a total reliance upon a professional clergy, upon licensed evangelists or missionaries to do the work of the whole body. A couple of weeks ago I learned in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area there are over 2,000 uh, Bhutanese who live there. They're refugees, escaped from Bhutan, and they have uh, their own like community. They, they come there and the government's kind of helped them to settle in. But by far, of all of the groups that, that live in that area, they have suffered tremendously as far as, as persecution from the people of the area. Uh, suicides are up, uh, great amounts of depression. Uh, the government says, well, some of this is due because they don't know language or they don't know culture or they don't know this or that. But the truth of the matter is they're suffering because they don't know Jesus Christ. Well, where was the church? The church is totally unprepared for this. They are starting now to, to get in and, and offer some, some various ministries to teach them and help them and help them uh, become enculturated and so forth. But it was a perfect example of the church sitting back and saying, well, that's somebody else's responsibility. That's another group. That's another area. That's, that's not me. But here are people who have great needs. They need Christ. I want to read to you part of chapter 4 of the book Radical by David Platt. And uh, if you've not read this book or heard it before, I, I challenge you to. It's an excellent book. David says, I remember exactly where I was sitting. It was a home where the leaders of an American church had gathered, a church that had demonstrated great kindness to me in the past, praying for me and even sending financial support completely unsolicited. The pastor sat immediately to my right. A couple of deacons were on the other side of the den. And this was Saturday evening, and I was invited to preach the following morning at their church. As we sat around the den, they asked me questions about how my wife and I were doing, and I shared with them some of the ministries that were going on in New Orleans, where we were living at that time. I told them about my ministry and the housing projects that were ridden with poverty and gang violence. I told them about ministry among homeless men and women who struggled with various kinds of addictions. Then I told them about the ministry opportunities that God had recently given me around the world. I told them about people, people's receptivity to the gospel in places that were traditionally hostile to Christianity. I told them that whether it was the inner city or overseas, God was drawing people to himself in some of the toughest areas of the world. Expecting them to share in my excitement, I paused, listening for their response. After an awkward silence, one of the deacons leaned forward in his chair and he looked at me and he said, David, I think it's great that you're going to all of these places. But if you ask me, I would just assume that God annihilate all of these people and send them to hell. That's exactly what he said. I was shocked, speechless. I had no idea what to say in response. 
I wish I had something to say, but I'm still not sure what I would have said. Annihilate them? Send them to hell? After a moment of silence, the room resumed conversation as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. But it got worse. The next morning, we arrived at the church building, and the worship service began. The pastor arose, and he welcomed everybody as he always did. During the introductory remarks, he began talking about how thankful he was to be living in the United States. I'm not sure what sparked the rousing patriotic address that followed, but in the next few minutes, he told the church that there was no chance that he would ever leave live anywhere else in the world. Amens were firing left and right from the crowd. Engulfed in a nationalistic zeal, I was waiting for Lee Greenwood to come out and burst into a song at any moment. Minutes later, I got up and I preached. I was going to tell the people, all of the nations need to hear the gospel of Christ. And when I was finished, I walked down to the front and the pastor closed the service with these words. Quote, Brother David, we are so excited about all that God is doing in New Orleans and in the nations. And we're excited that you're serving there. And brother, we promise that we will send a check so that we won't have, so that we won't have to go there ourselves. He wasn't finished. I remember a time in my last congregation when a missionary from Japan came to speak. I told the church that if they didn't give financial support to this missionary, I was going to pray that God would send their kids to Japan to serve with that missionary. Wow! Did the pastor just threaten the congregation with punishment of going to the world? He continued. And my church gave him a laptop and a whole lot of money. So apparently the threat worked. The service was dismissed. My wife and I climbed into our car and drove home. We could hardly believe the things that we had heard. The range of emotions consumed me. Anger, sadness, disappointment, confusion. But as I began to process what had happened over the last 24 hours... I was struck with the, the frightening realization. Could it be that this deacon and this pastor expressed what most professing Christians in America today believe, but are not bold enough to say? This may sound a bit harsh, but consider the reality. How many of us are embracing the comforts of suburban America while we turn a deaf ear to the inner city's needs for the gospel? How many of us are so settled in the United States that we have never once seriously thought of the possibility that God would call us to live in another country? How often are we willing to give a check to someone else as long as we don't have to go to the tough places of the world? How many of us parents are praying that God will raise up our children to leave their homes and go overseas? even if it means that we may never see them again? And how many of us are devoting our lives to taking the gospel to people in hostile regions around the world where Christians are not welcomed? Certainly few of us would be bold to say that we would just as soon God annihilate all of those people and send them to hell. But if we do not take the gospel to them, isn't that exactly where they will go? He was struck by the reality of what a few people said, but his conclusions are quite valid. I probably shared with you before, but I recall growing up in the United Church of Christ, which was formerly the Evangelical and Reformed Church. One of our mission projects stood out in my mind as we sent 40 pigs to Venezuela. We had never been taught to look upon the third world as having nothing more than a social program. If we could help the way they eat, help the way they grow their crops, then we were helping out the people for the greatest good. 
Not one word about those who needed the Savior. The second mission project was for the children of our church to raise money for UNICEF, United Nations Children's Fund. Sponsor a missionary's child, buy Bibles to have others read of the gospel? Hardly. Never. Again from Andrew Murray. How can the church be aroused to know and to do our Lord's will for the salvation of men? You see, Andrew Murray at this time, he was book was written in response to a missions conference that took place in, in New York City. It was the largest mission conference of his time. Uh, 1910 was the year. And he couldn't come, he didn't come. But he read the messages and those things that were given, and his book was in response to that. He truly believed that the evangelical church at that time had enough resources to evangelize the entire world. He sincerely believed they had enough manpower, enough money to do it. So his question is, why was it not being done? Why then, he asked, with millions of Christians around the world, is the army fighting the host of darkness so small? Well, it was the lack of heart, he believes. He says, because there was so little enthusiasm for the king. Quote, Though much may be done by careful organization and strict discipline and good generalship to make the best of a few troops we have, there is nothing that can so restore the confidence and courage as the actual practice of a beloved king to whom every heart beats warm and loyal devotion. The missionary problem is a personal one. Murray's summary is that the reason that the church doesn't move is because that the members of the church are so distant from the king. They're not loyal to him as they could be. Our loyalties are so divided, he talks about. I think I could say, knowing the history of our church, the Bible Presbyterian Church has, in its relatively short period of time, been a missionary church. We have sent more missionaries out than any denomination with our numbers than any other has ever had. The Great Commission is clear, memorized and frequently used passages, even as we read earlier. From the scriptural impetus of the Christian missions, we see the interpretation of the larger catechism, the answer to question number 60. The answer is, they who having never heard the gospel, now know Jesus Christ and believe not in him, cannot be saved. But they never are so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature or the laws of the religion which they profess. Neither is there salvation in any other, but in Christ alone, who is the Savior only of the body of the church. We must go and tell the world. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 